All right, go ahead and open up to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. I know Dennis left off in chapter 3. We're going to be in chapter 3 very soon, but let's go to chapter 1 just for a, a quick review. We have about two months remaining for Sunday school before the summer break, so I want to finish the book of Colossians probably two, three, four more weeks maybe, and then we have several points left in our doctrinal uh, study from the Morris Corner Church Statement of Faith. So we'll finish Colossians, try to get that done, and then move on to that. So before we pick up in chapter 3, just a quick summary of the book of Colossians. As you can see, Colossians was written by, well you knew this of course, right? Who didn't know it was written by Paul? You all knew that. Uh, probably around the year 60 AD. And the theme, generally accepted, the theme of Colossians is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Uh, Colossians is one of the prison epistles. What are the other prison epistles? Who knows? Marcus. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Exactly. So it's one of the prison epistles. And we'll see when we study chapter 4 that Colossians and Philemon were definitely written right around the same time, and the others probably as well. So as I said, the theme of the book is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? If you were to put it in your own words, what would, what would that mean? Christ is better. Christ is better. Larry. Christ should be first. Okay, he should be first. Marcus. Yeah, the, the, Larry got it. Okay. All right, let's look at chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Paul says about Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have what? The preeminence. Okay, why should Christ have the preeminence? Well, we learn this in verse 19. Because it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And that's the fullness of deity. So the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is divine. He is God in human flesh. And that verse in uh, chapter 1, verse 15, where it says he's the firstborn over all creation. You remember the firstborn in the family had preeminence. When the father would die, the firstborn son would then be head of the family. So uh, firstborn is not... Jesus being born in a moment in time that he's created, it's uh, his rank, his, his position. Why was Paul writing the book of Colossians? This is what we want to spend a few moments on. The answer is, <laughs> to give you a little hint, the answer is on the screen. Gnosticism. <laughs> yeah, combating uh, Gnosticism. How many of you know what Gnosticism is? Mark, uh, the other Mark. <laughs> First, yeah, it's, it's uh, being much more superior to those around you because I know so much more. Right. God has just granted me with insight into this word. Okay, you're on the right track because gnosis, as you can see, it's spelled with a G. Gnosis means knowledge. So there's this select group that has this secret uh, knowledge or this hidden knowledge. What were you going to say? Well, yes, it, it's, they kind of worshipped <laughs> knowledge. Uh, and as we read it, we have to be careful that that's not true of us. Right. I mean, it's, it's great that you can recite the books of the Bible in 30 seconds or less, but just knowing that, that doesn't really amount to anything. All it does is help you find verses fast or something. Right. But, so it's, knowledge has to be applied. It's, it's got to be applied. Okay, so it's all about this knowledge. Something I've noticed today, uh, people tend to, it sounds to me like some people worship 
science, right? We're always hearing science says everything. If, if the science says it, it's as if God says it. You know, we, we say, okay, if God says it, that settles it. But for the world, it's, well, if science says it, that settles it. So that's kind of the knowledge uh, that people worship. To, and we're, we love science because science has done great things. But science doesn't actually say anything. People say things based on conclusions that are sometimes uh, not always uh, correct. But anyways, with Gnosticism, it means knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge. How many of you have heard of the Gnostic Gospels? Uh, this was big years ago when that book came out, The Da Vinci Code. And then there was the movie. Uh, there's the Gospel of Thomas. That was kind of the big uh, Gnostic Gospel. Uh, so the Gnostics taught that the Old Testament God, and you, you recognize the problem right there, they taught that the Old Testament God did create the heavens and the earth, he did create human beings, but he is not the true God. They call him a demiurge, which basically means uh, a being that's subordinate to the true God. So they said that Jesus came as a messenger of the true God, but the Old Testament God was, well, essentially evil. So this is the teachings of the Gnostics. So it's believed that Paul was writing to combat an early form of this. And you'll even hear people today who call themselves Christians talking about the God of the Old Testament as compared to the God of the New Testament as if, as if they're different. They're not different. So I would argue that Gnosticism uh, has kind of crept into some uh, church traditions and I think we're going to see in a moment that even in our culture, there's this Gnostic idea. I saw a couple hands. Larry, did you have something yeah, a moment ago? I was just uh, thinking about science and our conscience. You know, conscience has science in it. A con is with, and science is knowledge, so that if we do something wrong, sin, and we know that it's wrong, our conscience bears witness. So we're sinning with knowledge, knowing that it's wrong. Okay. Okay, Marcus. Oh, a couple of examples close to our church here. One is the University of Massachusetts, uh, where so many of us work. And at one time I thought, wow, these people have never done a day's work in their life. They've done nothing but gone to school, got yeah. masters, got doctorates, taught. And that's all they've ever done. It's all about information, and it's about false information. Yeah. But this Gnosticism, there's a an arrogance about it. There's a, they feel they're superior. It's like, I'm sad to say, every time we drive up the driveway, tolerant skepticism. Yes. Right. Tolerant skepticism. Say, oh yeah, let those people up there, they can think anything they want. They're just right. a bunch of religious fanatics. <laughs> and the poor and the poor guy is headed for hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So Gnosticism, you say, well, what does this have to do with Colossians? To really understand what Colossians is about, why Paul is writing, we have to understand the purpose of why he wrote this letter in the first place. So knowing this information should give us a little insight. So the whole reason Paul is saying that Jesus is the image of the invisible God and that he is the firstborn over all creation, the reason Paul is stressing the deity of Christ is because the Gnostics said that all material things are evil, therefore God could not, or he certainly would not come in human flesh. So the Gnostics were denying the deity of Christ that God would not take human form. But they did say about Jesus that he was a emissary or a messenger of the true God who came to share this hidden knowledge or gnosis with this select people who were in the know and then everybody else is kind of down here. We're just the, the peasants and we don't know any better. So that's kind of the Gnostic attitude that we are superior and we know it all. Kind of like our government today. Well, yeah, our government today. That's what Kareem said, not me. Okay. <laughs> but how many of you have heard of the term spark of divinity? No. Well, there, there's been some very well-known, powerful people who talk about the spark 
of divinity. The human beings have the spark of divinity. That comes from Gnosticism. Uh, the, and also the idea of being non-binary, androgyny. Uh, there's no gender or it's fluid and you can kind of go back and forth. This is a Gnostic idea. The Gnostics believe to reach this state of divinity or to have this God consciousness, you know, you wouldn't be male or female. So a lot of the things being pushed in our culture right now are very closely associated with Gnosticism, a rejection of the Old Testament, that's very common, non-binary, select few, having all the knowledge. So this is also relevant uh, as well. The Da Vinci Code, massive, that was a bestseller. Everyone was reading, that was really big. Why? Because the ideas are popular. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I think I know why the, the Gospel of Thomas did not become in Scripture because he was the one that had to see to believe. And uh, it's our faith. We haven't seen him, and yet we believe. Amen. So that's Amen. probably where he got ruled out. He was probably casting doubt on things. Yeah, no, well, and the Gospel of Thomas was not written by Thomas. Oh. It was written in the second or third century, and to make it appear legitimate, they just attached the name of an apostle to it. So it wasn't even actually written by Thomas. So. Let's just wrap up this whole idea. The physical world we know is not evil. When God created all things, what did he say? It is good. It is, good. It is very good. It is, and yes, it is very good. That's what he said about the creation. It's true, and there's always a, a little bit of truth to every lie. It's true that the creation is, because of sin, under the curse. And it has been corrupted. That's true. But what is Christ doing? Why did Christ come? He came to redeem not only souls, he came to redeem the creation. So Gnosticism uh, was declared a heresy in the early church. This is an early form of it. If anyone ever tells you, oh, why, why don't you accept these other books, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, just know that this is a completely different idea of God uh, and it's, it's something that Paul was opposing here. All right, any final comments or questions on that? Peter's good. Peter is good. The Gospel of Peter is not yeah. because it wasn't I written by... The Gospel is in the <laughs> epistles that he wrote. It would be like me writing, uh, I don't know, the Gospel, or not the Gospel, but... What does the Greenfield Recorder call it? I don't know, but <laughs> if I wrote a book about the life of George Washington, and I wrote it as like an autobiography entitled it, you know, The Life of George Washington. Well, I can't do that. But a thousand years from now, if you didn't know any better, hey, it has his name on it. Maybe this was really written by him. So the Gospel of Thomas, not, not legitimate. Okay, let's turn to chapter three. So hopefully that should help us to kind of know where Paul is coming from. And of course, Dennis uh, did cover most of the doctrinal points in uh, the book of Colossians. So we're kind of picking up now where it comes down to practical Christian living, uh, the character of the new man, that's starting in chapter 3, verse 12, and then verses 18 through 24, that's going to get into the Christian home. We may or may not have, have time for that. So look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, therefore, based on everything Paul has written about the doctrine, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. So as Christians, this is how we should live. This is how we should behave. Put on tender mercies. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Okay, let's begin by asking a simple question. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2, Paul refers, he's writing and speaking to who? The elect of God. I don't know about you, when I was younger... I vividly remember this. Somebody um, told me that when the Bible talked about the elect 
or the elect of God, that that's a reference to the Jews. That's not a reference to Christians. That's a reference to the Jews. Now, here's the thing. That's, that's true to a degree, but it's not completely accurate. So let's look up some verses just to find out uh, who the elect are. Uh, Isaiah 42, let's turn there. And, and you know by now, what does elect mean? Chosen. chosen. So the elect of God are God's chosen, or God's chosen people. I'm fairly confident if you walked into any evangelical church, any Baptist church, if you asked a person, who are the chosen, who are God's chosen people? Say Jews. Yeah, they're going to say the Jews are God's chosen people. There's no, uh, the majority of people will say the Jews are God's chosen people. And again, that's true in a sense, but who is Paul writing to? The church right. at Colossae. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, and I think it's helpful that we clear this up. And it should be an encouragement to you that if you believe in Christ, you are one of God's chosen Amen. people. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So you can see there's the dis he's distinguishing between the elect one, and then there's the Gentiles. Well, who is he talking about here? Jesus. Jesus? Okay. All right. Now let's go to Isaiah 45, verse 4. So that's true that Jesus is God's chosen or God's elect. So Jesus is God's elect. That's true. Look at Isaiah 45, verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. So not only is Jesus God's elect, who else? What other man is God's elect? Jacob. Jacob is God's elect. And Jacob had his name changed to Israel. So the children of Israel can be called God's chosen people. And in the Old Testament, that is 100% true. That in, kind of has been shortened down to the Jews are God's chosen people. In the Old Testament, correct. So Jesus is God's chosen. Jacob was God's chosen. His children, grandchildren, the children of Israel are God's chosen. Following along so far? Good. Okay, Marcus. And this is why it was very wise of those that were trying to form a nation of Jewish people together that they chose the name Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel and if they wanted to take claim to the land, they wanted to find the furthest back documents that said the land belonged to them. And so, whoosh, right, to the, <laughs> right to the Old Testament they went. Yeah, when the nation of Israel was constituted in 1948, there was some debate, what should we call it? Yeah. Israel was one of the options, and obviously that won out. There were a few other options of what they were uh, proposing that it be called. I bet you're thankful they called it Israel. Yeah, yeah I, I, bet, I bet you are. Jim. This is one of the few uh, verses in the Old Testament where it's focused toward the Gentiles as well. Okay. Because if you read it, it says, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay. And that's, that's the Gentiles. Okay. Uh, go to Isaiah 65. One more verse in Isaiah. So, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were God's chosen people. Isaiah 65, verse 9, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, an heir of my mountains, my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. So it's very clear that the children of Israel in the Old Testament were God's chosen people. But now, here in the book of Colossians, go back to Colossians 3, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Where is Colossae located? This, is not, this isn't Jerusalem. This isn't even in Israel. Colossae, this is a Gentile area. So the Christians in Colossae would have been a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Uh, let's just say 
for the sake of argument, that 75% of the people in the Colossian church were Gentiles and 25% were Jewish. Um, Paul calls them, what's that noise? Downstairs. Oh, that's downstairs, okay. They got tambourines down there, is that what that is? <laughs> All right, so Paul is writing to who? Christians, right? And he calls them God's elect. So in the New Testament, in this age, Christians are God's elect. Right. To me, again, that's, a, that's an encouragement that, yes, in the Old Testament, we read about God's chosen people. Amen. We still believe there's a future for the children of Israel. But right now, it's believers in Christ who are God's chosen people. So because you are God's elect, what should you do? You should live as God wants you to live. Um, you are a follower of Christ. We, we do what Christ wants us to do. Okay, look at verse 12 again. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. So that's the encouragement to you this morning. When God looks at you, he sees you in Christ. He doesn't see all your faults and all your failures. He sees Christ, essentially. Go back to verses 1 and 3, or 1 through 3 of chapter 3. Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when God looks at you, what does he see? He sees Christ. Amen. All right, so that's the teaching here in this chapter. Uh, now we're getting into the application. Uh, this is what should be on display in our lives. Look at verse uh, 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Uh, so let's go through some of these some of these uh, attributes. Uh, put on tender mercies. What does that mean, tender mercies? Charity. Charity? Anybody else? Uh, just being a forgiving attitude toward fellow believers. Okay, mercy, yeah, mercy is loving kindness, basically. So Jesus had a heart of compassion towards other people. And because that's who Jesus was and we're his followers, therefore, we should have a heart of compassion towards other people. I think the general attitude in our culture today is that you have a, a kind attitude towards others as long as they're doing what you want them to do. <laughs> You're kind and you have a heart of compassion towards people as long as they agree with you. Right? I mean, that's kind of the way a lot of people are. That's not the way we should be. We are called to love even our enemies. And that's a really difficult thing to do. But if the Spirit of God is within us, uh, Jesus loved his enemies. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? Forgive them. Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's, that's as Dennis would say, a God thing, right? <laughs> That's not something a human being would be inclined to do at all. In general, especially not at that moment. Larry. Um, well, I was just thinking about, I mean, these are characteristics of Christ's likeness. And uh, I know for myself, you know, you always hear, don't ever pray for patience. <laughs> yeah. Because yep. you'll get tribulation. <laughs> That's almost like, in my, in my life, praying for compassion to help me love my neighbors or to love other people, sometimes you get somebody who's very hard to love yeah. in your life. And, but it comes down to my attitude on how I respond to that person or people. And it, that, it's very difficult right. to uh, be yeah. compassionate 
Mm -hmm. at times. It's easy when, again, people, they think like us, they do what we think they should do. And it's easy to love those people and be compassionate. Well, that's not what he's talking about here. It's just in general. And yeah, and if you pray, Lord, help me to put on tender mercies, he might bring someone into your life that makes you, you know, that puts that to the test a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, there's somebody out there, somebody, at least with most of us, that finds you or finds me hard to love. Mm -hmm. well, I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably true. If only the pastels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tony finds it hard to love my ties. <laughs> but he's trying, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's spring, you're only going to get more <laughs> bright ties. So Jesus had a heart of compassion towards others. We should do the same. And then the next word is kindness. Uh, kindness. Uh, we all know what kindness is. I don't think there's any need to uh, expand on that. Humility and meekness. Uh, the two are closely associated with one another. First, meekness. What does it mean to be meek? Now, I know if you attend Wednesdays, uh, in the Old Testament, meekness and humility, there was a place where it meant the same thing. Here there's a distinction. So meekness means what? Yes. Marcus. Me? Yes, you. Um, I call it controlled strength. Controlled strength. Okay. That's a good answer. Stacy. Could it be gentleness? Gentleness, exactly. So here... The Greek word translated humility literally means to have lowliness of mind. So, we, you know, if you're the best at something, you don't go around telling people you're the best. Mm -hmm. Or if you think you're really good at something, you know, what does uh, Proverbs 27 2 say? Who knows that verse? Proverbs, uh -huh. Proverbs 27 2. No. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. So if you're really that great, someone else, let them praise you. But have lowliness of mind. So we, we should not think highly of ourselves. Uh, we should love ourselves and self-esteem. There's all some valid points to all that, but we don't want to think highly of ourselves. Certainly not more than we should. But meekness is a little different. It's, it's gentleness. Uh, Jen. It's just... When you said that we all know what kindness is, it's just interesting because you see it on all the shirts now in the world where you can be anything and be kind. It's like they're trying to change the definition of kindness right. to receiving of all everything. Right. Want. Yeah. Yeah, if you were really kind, you would do what I want. You would think the way I think. You would accept everything. Of course, the people who, you know, in all fairness, and I think they'd have to recognize this, even they don't do that. I mean, nobody is accepting of everything, like tolerance. Um, you need to be more inclusive. Right. Well, I, you know, well, then you should be inclusive too. You should be inclusive of Christians and in, in the way we. <laughs> and I'm not saying to do this in a confrontational way, but 99% of the time, when somebody throws something at you like that, just turn it around on them. Yeah. I say, well, do you do that? And then, because usually they, they don't. But, I mean, that's the way people are. That's across the board. Yeah. Well, this list is, can't help but be reminded of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and depending on your translation, you know, gentleness and, gentleness and kindness are different things. And uh, if you take a different translation, you'll have different, but they're so similar. But the way to achieve these, of course, is to, to put off the old self, put the old self to death. That means you, the, the old you, before you were saved, has just plain got to die, got to die. Right. And with gentleness and kindness, remember when we do talk to other people, the goal is not to tell them they're wrong or to prove them wrong. The goal is to win them over. Mm -hmm. Right. Because uh, you can say the right thing, but have the wrong motivation. Just to kind of say, I'm correct and you're wrong. Well, the goal is to show them what the Word of God says and to win them over to Christ. So we need to be wise in how we uh, interact. Um, yeah, all right, one more. 
Question. <laughs> sure. Question. Question. Um, who wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People? Um, I sh I'm supposed to know this, no, I guess. No, you don't have to, but I, <laughs> anyway, Doug McLeod had it. I, I read it and I, I found there were some really good, good examples okay. of ways to, to make conversations with people to just find out if they're friendly or not. Be, there you go. Who is it? Dale Carnegie. Dale, Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. It's okay. a good one. It's a good. There's good ways to, to that's start as old conversations. As I had that book. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> What's that? I said that book is almost as old as I. I remember that being out when I was a kid. And here, yeah. those two people were talking the same time. All I right. said that book is as, almost as old as I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so, see, Mike was. I understand. I get the same thing. All right. If you want a good read, check it out. Okay. Yep. All right, so Christians should be humble. If there was ever a man uh, who had the right and a reason to boast, who was it? Christ. And here he is, God in human flesh, having all knowledge and wisdom. Uh, he, he is the only man who was ever perfect, but because he was perfect, he didn't boast. And then meekness, again, refers to gentleness. So Jesus... Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily the same as gentleness, but I think of Jesus as being accessible. You know, the common man could approach him and he would spend time with people that nobody even wanted anything to do with. Uh, and, and this isn't necessarily their fault, but if you think of the, the famous religious leaders today, the famous pastors today, and I'm sure many of them would take time with the common man, so to speak, if, if they could. But they're very much inaccessible, right? There, there's no way you could ever get a meeting with, with some of these guys. Jesus would just go from place to place. Uh, little kids, remember one time the, their children came up to him and the disciples were irritated. Like, get these kids out of here. And what did Jesus do? He, he rebuked his disciples, took the kids up into his arms and, and blessed them. So Jesus was accessible. He took the time for people that couldn't do anything for him. But that wasn't what it was about. He wanted to do something for them. So that should be uh, our attitude as well. Yes. Um, King James puts part of that verse, humbleness of mind, and it just brings it to mind what you're just saying about Jesus. I mean, he was a king. He was God. But he didn't, he didn't walk around saying, that's who I am. He was humble in his mind. Right. So that he could associate with those that were... Jesus, yeah, Jesus, even though he was God in flesh, he, he really was the king of Israel. That was his rightful uh, position. He didn't go around telling everybody. Now, there are reasons for that. And, of course, today is Palm Sunday. This was the day that Jesus revealed himself as, as the king. Uh, also, Paul talks about uh, forgiving one another. Just when it comes to forgiveness... How many times has Christ forgiven you? 490. 490 and then 491. Sorry, pal. And I lost count, so we started all over again. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you know the answer is... 70 times 70. Higher than you can count. So if Jesus has forgiven you, what is that? To infinity. Infin and yeah. Well, it's probably not that much, but it might as well be. But if the Lord has forgiven us that many times, again, that should be our attitude. That we should forgive, forgive others. And He's forgiven us even without us knowing that we have done something to offend someone right. or Him. And He forgives us freely. You don't have to do penance and right. say fifty prayers and. You know, walk around on your hands and knees on broken glass all afternoon. He just freely forgives. Now, there's still consequences to what, things that we do wrong, uh, but Jesus freely forgives. Larry. And it's not a suggestion. You know, eh, maybe if you feel like you do it, he said, no, you must forgive. You must. Yeah. And... And just like what you said, how much have we been forgiven? And everybody needs forgiveness to some degree. And it says, 
also in Scripture that if you do not forgive, I can't remember if it's your brother, or if you do not forgive, then God will not forgive you right. as well. Right. There was um, an incident, I think it was last year, where a police officer, um, I don't know if it was a woman, she, she went into an apartment maybe and mm -hmm. shot somebody I forget I forget the exact details but she shot somebody uh, who you know it shouldn't have happened mm -hmm. and she went uh, to court and she was on trial and you know it was one of those white cop and a right. black individual and uh, the, the victim's brother asked the judge can I go and and hug the police yeah. officer and maybe pray with her I think he gave her a Bible I don't know what the guy's theology was, but that's about the strongest Christian witness that you're ever going to find. Like Sabrina. Yeah, right. Well, as long as you brought up police work, um, flashbacks are coming. Okay. But uh, it was a good thing. In, in, in interpersonal relationships, which is what we're looking for, we're looking for to make friends out of people and then make them brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ. Um, all right, police and their interaction with other people is confrontative. It's it's hand to hand combat. Sometimes it's weapons. You know, it's not not pleasant. But God taught me things from Scripture. One is in Proverbs that what is it? Uh, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Right. And so when these guys are all wild and want to fight or insult you or whatever, you just say, easy boys, easy boys. Because you can, you know, you can pick a fight. I can pick a fight with anyone. Yeah. Be easy. Just insult them. Yeah, that's one of my favorite verses from Proverbs. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Just how you respond uh, can kind of set the course. You get more bees with honey. Yeah. You get yeah. bees? <laughs> <laughs> we know what you meant. Yeah. yeah go All right. Now, Jesus, we talk about love and being Christ like and tender mercies. At the same time, Jesus was not one dimensional. There were, were times Jesus had a righteous indignation. So there are times, uh, Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes 3 1 to everything there is a season time for every purpose under heaven. So there are those rare moments where you need to be firm, at the very least firm. But 99% of the time, uh, be humble, be gentle. Well, 100% with being humble. But um, Jesus, there were those moments. Paul, there were those moments. And if there is an incident where somebody does something to you, or, or they say something, they do something, I always say, for unity's sake, if you can let it go, but please let it go. Yeah. Um, but there are times where you can't let it go, and that's understandable. There are times maybe where you shouldn't even let it go. That's when you go to the person directly and as respectfully as you can, you say, here's what you said or here's what you did, and that really hurt my feelings or it made me feel this way. Most of the time, they didn't intend to do that. But if they did, there, there's a process. That's Matthew chapter 18. You might need a little mediation. But, you know, most of the time, if we just follow these basic principles uh, in Scripture, we're going to resolve all of these problems. Yes? Capital punishment. And if you said Ecclesiastes, I was thinking, gee, is there a time to kill? And there is. A time to kill and a time to heal. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's great contrast is what he's talking about. Right. So there is a time to kill. Yeah, that's true. Okay, verse 14. But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It's also translated the bond of unity. Okay, so love is the bond of unity. I think I try to preach a sermon on unity at least once a year, if not more than that, but at least once a year, because love really is the glue that binds us together. Love is what holds it together. A love for God, a love for one another, 
And I think one of the reasons why this church has had unity is because there is an emphasis on doctrine. And, and we know these things. Uh, so you don't have to wonder, well, how should I handle this? Or what is right and what is true? Uh, because the, the truth has been taught and reinforced that that helps us with unity. And then just being compassionate and letting things go and, and thinking the best of someone. Um, that, well, they didn't mean it that way, or they're not trying to do this. Uh, because when someone does do something they shouldn't, or they stop being respectful and considerate, that has a ripple effect. Uh, but when people uh, are doing the right thing, we just have that kind of placid water, and everything's calm, and, and I'm thankful for uh, the fact that this church is is more or less like that, you know, most most of the time. So we're we're very blessed to have that here. Uh, verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So he talks about the peace of God. So speaking of sound doctrine and kind of reinforcing things, who knows what I'm going to say right now? The peace of God. How do you have the peace of God? There, there is a prerequisite for having the peace of God. And what is that? Understanding Scripture. Understanding Scripture. Is it prayer? Prayer. Uh, see, no one can read my mind. I'm going to have to do another sermon on this. Believing in God. <laughs> Believing in God. Living as this is describing. Yeah. All right. These are, these are all good answers. But to have the peace of God, you must first have peace with God. And some of you, what you're saying is along the same lines. So let's flip back uh, to chapter 1 again, just for a moment. So just a simple thing to remember, a person cannot have the peace of God, right? We talk about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You can't have that until you first have peace with God. In other words, you need to be saved. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to have the peace of God. One of the things you're going to be afraid of is death. And there's people that live in fear. Uh, they're just, what happens when I die? And they do things to try to cover that up. Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through what? Okay, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So peace with God is salvation. Uh, before a person comes uh, to faith, before a person is a child of God, what does the scripture say? They are at enmity with God. So the opposite of peace is what? Conflict. Right? Warfare. Conflict. So if somebody does not know Christ, if they don't know God through Christ, they, there is this conflict between them and God. They might not even know it, but they know they don't have peace. And people do all sorts of things to try to, again, cover that up or bring peace. The only way to have peace in this world and... You know this is true, especially the last few years when, you know, it, sometimes you look around and you say, what is happening? Um, mm. And it can really stress you out if you focus on it. Mm. But if you look at the way, um, look at things the way God wants you to look at things, you really can have peace even though there's turmoil mm. all there. How, how many of you can bear witness of that? Amen. Yeah. So to have peace, the peace of God, you need to first have peace with God, and that is only through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, uh, that's about it. So we're going to have to stop here, and we'll pick up uh, in Colossians chapter 3 next time.